Welcome to Archaeology Books for Fun, digging books that aren't drier than dirt. I'm your host, Tristan Herrenstein, and with me as always, my co-host, Barbara Clark. Hi, everybody. And today we are moving on to the second episode of Artifacts, a Fei Long Champ Mystery by Mary Anna Evans. Before we do that, though, as per usual, if you are listening to this as a podcast, please like, subscribe, and review. YouTube, please uh, leave us a comment, hit subscribe and follow as well. All that feedback really helps us out, and it helps us know that people are enjoying the podcast. Also, before we go into the meat of the podcast, this is the second of three planned episodes for Artifacts. So next month will be our final one. And so we realized that it was a good time to talk about what our next book might be. And we thought we'd try something a little different this time because but we thought we'd get your feedback. So if you're on Spotify, check out the poll. We'll have three books up there. And also, if you're not on Spotify, check the show notes. We'll at least have links in there. And you can always send us a comment or something if you have something that you, and you can't access Spotify. So three books. First possibility, frauds, myths, and mysteries, science, and pseudoscience in archaeology. And so this one is from, written in 1990, and it's all about basically the pseudoscience that we deal with all the time. You've heard us reference it a little bit in some of these books. This will be a book basically all about that and kind of how it's never alien, basically. Our next book is Kindred, Neanderthal Life, Love, Death, and Art. So most of you probably know about Neanderthal, or maybe you know them as Neanderthal, but actually a lot of that first wave of research on it was extremely poor. And so this book is dealing with much more recent information. I think it's less than 10 years old. So this is pretty up to date as far as our current understanding of the Neanderthal. And it's actually a lot more nuanced than you might expect. The final option is The Lost City of the Monkey God. This one seems interesting to me. It's also a very recent one. And this is all about essentially uh, there's some good stories of explorers in the past meeting untimely ends and then explorers today using LIDAR in particular to help them identify lost or unrecorded, let's say that way, temples and such in Honduras. So yeah, check out those links, check out the poll, let us know if you have a preference or what your preference is, and we'll start with that book next time. We'll announce whatever book was chosen next month. In other news, uh, we actually reached out to Mariana Evans, the author of this book, and she responded, and she actually even shared our last podcast on her social media, which I was excited about. And we are working on, hopefully having an interview with her as well. So keep your ears tuned for that. Yeah. So on to the book, kind of a quick recap of the last one. Basically, we are off a mythical portion of the Florida coast, and there was an archaeological investigation going on there. And two of the students that stayed overnight to do some work were murdered. Our main character, Faye, has a home that she has inherited out there, but is in financial and legal troubles. And she is scrambling to get the funds together. And a lot of the way she gets the funds together is by looting archaeological sites that she believes were a part of her family heritage, but were stolen from them. And there's a bunch of little threads going on. Yeah, and I think we learned this segment, we learn a lot more about the characters. I feel like the characters get a little bit more developed. Yeah. So there's a lot of people that were briefly mentioned in our last segment that now become more prominent, I guess, in this portion of the book. There's a lot of characters. Yeah, there are a, a lot, lot of, of characters. characters. I don't find having them separate out too difficult, though. No, no. And one thing I find interesting is like even some of the characters are no longer alive, like the historical characters from the journal. Yeah. You know, but they become characters in the book themselves, especially in this portion. Yeah, for sure. OK, so starting up with chapter 11. We start with Nguyen, who is the shady character they've seen around a bit, who they suspect is a looter. And in this time, oh, we also know he's in cahoots with Wally over something. And so here we find out that he absolutely is a looter. He is targeting the Clovis site that Faye found indications might be in the area. And also a shipwreck with uncommon treasure, which we don't know what that is yet. I'm very curious about that because as you and I know, 
most shipwrecks, you know, everybody thinks, oh, gold and, you know, valuables and jewels. But especially in the Gulf Coast, it being so shallow, if a ship wrecked, the Spanish could just retrieve a lot, if not all of what was on that wreck. And they didn't ship gold through here. Yeah, you know, well, the there's reason, that too. The reason the treasure fleets are where they are is because they were going around the Florida Peninsula. Yeah. There was no reason to bring them up into this area. Yeah. So it'll be very interesting to see what this treasure... The uncommon treasure, yes. too. I like, I'm like. i very curious about that. Yeah. Yeah. We also find out that he is very much aware of Faye and essentially plans to set her up to take the fall if he gets caught. He knows that she's looting the area and he basically thinks he can get that yeah arranged but if she gets close this is important too if she gets close he'll remove her by any means necessary which we find that out later on yes we do switching to magda she's teaching a class of recently or soon to graduate high school students kind of giving some yeah i guess it's like a uh introductory yeah to college kind of lecture basically yeah almost like an orientation type yeah. situation one of the interesting things i have in here was that she says full top cans will one day be artifacts i knew you would make a note of that i did as well yep. i do want to say you know how she talks about how they may be mistaken for religious items and mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, they probably won't because now yep. we have historic documentation as to what they were. So as long as you have the historic documentation, you'll be able to be like, oh, that's a pull tab from right. whatever. But it, it does remind me a little bit of the idea of Motel of Mysteries. Yeah. If you are interested, I highly recommend checking that out. It's basically a satirical piece about how archaeologists overestimate how much we understand what's going on. Yeah. And uh, it's very entertaining, especially if you understand a little bit of archaeology and how that works. It's not something we'll cover here because it's illustrated as well. That won't work in a podcast format. Yeah. But I do like the fact that she uh, says, you know, when they when you guess the purpose of something, you will be wrong. And this is part of the scientific mm -hmm. process. And I feel like even archaeologists, we sometimes forget that yep. science changes, what we know about the past changes, and it's all built on previous information. So even if that information was wrong, it was a building block to get us to the correct answer. It's important to be aware you may not have been wrong in the moment, right? but that it becomes wrong if you don't change with the information. Yeah. And that can be hard, especially for someone who's built their career right. on a certain theory that's disproven, but it's still important. You created that building block. But that's why the scientific process exists the way it exactly. does. Exactly. And not that an individual won't fail at that, but as a process, it can eventually overcome that is the idea. Yeah. Oh, and one little tidbit about pull top cans is they became artifacts about 2015. So they are all artifacts now, but the, this book was written in 2003. So they were not at the time. Okay. You're very nerdy for looking that up, Tristan. I did look it up. <laughs> I like it. Um, we also get a little bit more of Senator Cyril Kirby, which we were both a little, thought he was a little skeezy last time, I think. Yeah. He didn't endear himself to me right away here either because he calls Magda as he's kind of asking about Faye and Magda kind of thinking she doesn't give him information, but she does give him more than she intends and when Faye shows up at the department library to do some research she's surprised that he's there. Well and he also acts I mean he's had conversations with Faye he knows Faye's name but he's kind of playing dumb and he's like you know that that student of yours right. or whatever she's the attractive petite 30-ish dark skinned girl it's like you know who she is right you know I know he's trying to just kind of play dumb or whatever be act naive but the way he does it is just cringy. Yep, not great. But he asked her to dinner and I she very cleverly deflected him to like lunch at the next day. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was pretty well handled on her part. I was impressed. I like how she does that kind of thing. She deflects people very effectively. Mm -hmm. Which Magna's picked up on, which we talked about yes. in our last episode. Magda, right? What did I say? Magna, I think. Uh, Y'all, I have a Tallahassee is in like the allergy capital of the United States and I am suffering. So if I sound like a mouse or I sound like I'm mispronouncing something, I do apologize. Or if you sound like you smoke 12 packs a day. Oh, goodness. It's been rough. And that's chapter 11. Uh, moving on to chapter 12. We start with Faye at Joyce telling Joe about her date. I love this interaction. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure to re how to read Joe on all this. Still. I'm not either. I don't know if he he feels kind of set aside, like maybe he thought he had a chance. I don't think so. I think it's more just like he's very uninterested in this. 
I, I'm I'm it's interesting to see how true, this true though because he looks into Cyril. Like yeah, in the, in well, the I next... think he looks into I think he looks into him because he feels protective of Faye, but I don't think he's looking at Faye as like a potential romantic partner. That's the in- unclear part, right? Because yeah. the indications are no, but then he's also acting potentially a little jealous. Yeah, but it could be almost a brotherly thing where he's more like just looking out, concerned yeah. for her. So yeah, it's interesting. I'm not sure how this is going to develop. Yet. And I don't think we have an answer this episode either, for no, sure. No, we do not. But yeah, so Joe, even though he didn't seem that interested, he ends up going to Wally's, the marina thing. Wally's also uh, Faye's friend, who is also, like we said, shady and in dealing with Nguyen. And he just kind of hangs out and watches Senator Kirby on TV and reads about him. Yeah, and he reads about him in the newspaper. This is where we get introduced to Liz, who I like Liz. I like her a lot, too. She's kind of seen some stuff, but she seems like also a a decent person. And she recognizes Joe and recognizes that he's the one that Hitman Stewart has been asking about. Someone else calls Joe in and Stewart shows up and pretends to be a fish and wildlife officer and basically very easily convinces Joe to go with him. And Liz, of course, knows that this is not on not, the up and up. Yeah, it's not going to be good for Joe. Grabs a pot of hot grease and confronts him and demands his badge. And then when he doesn't give away, he basically he knocks him over and dumps hot grease, grease all over on. him, which is fantastic. Yeah, no, I like her. She's She's got moxie. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess at some point, well, Joe gets away and then the sheriff gets there, but Stuart's gone. Right. Joe's gone. Everybody's gone. It's already happened. She wasn't going to try and detain him, I don't yeah, think. Yeah, so. she just wanted Joe to get away. Right. And that's chapter 12. Yeah. So this one starts with descriptions of heavy storm in Central America. And I'm like, oh, we're going to have a hurricane. Yeah. That's ex- <laughs> yep. If you follow hurricanes in the Gulf, a lot of times they'll start in or hit Central America first or they'll start there and then they'll strengthen as it comes across the Gulf. Yep. And that's when us Floridians start paying attention is when it enters the Gulf and is it going to hit, you know, South or Central America? Is it going to come up the Gulf and hit us or is it going to bounce off? Head towards Texas. Yeah. It could be anywhere in between. But that's usually when we start paying attention here in right. the panhandle. But none of our characters seem to be aware of this yet because they're not very good Floridians. <laughs> This chapter starts with Faye at Wally's after all this other stuff has happened. And apparently there's a park service guy present. Which I found that funny because they make it seem like the, and I know this would be the federal park service because right. it's federal land, but they make it seem like they're law enforcement yeah. and they're not. In this case, most likely, even with it being federal land, it's usually like FWC, which is our Fish and Wildlife Commission here in Florida, or somebody like that doing the questioning. Right. So I was like, yeah, but I get for, you know, the story's sake for keeping it simple and something everybody would understand. Yeah, I also found it interesting. Well, there's a great quote from Liz. Hang the government. Goddamn taxes. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, she just shouts that from the back room or whatever. I also found it interesting, though. Uh, I feel like it's overstating the legal risk. Oh. To people who are doing this kind of activity, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I know that. And this isn't how they go about investigating it either. Like, essentially, the ones, the bus we've had is they'll go undercover for years, visit the shows, pretend to be buyers. Like we saw a bit of that with dealing history. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what we've seen here in the U.S. too. But they have to build a case over a long period before they can actually get these guys. You don't just walk around asking about them. Yeah, they have to essentially be caught in the act. Right. And admitting it and on record and all that Mm -hmm. stuff. We also find that the Park Service guy is asking questions because they've seen some artifacts showing up that they know on the black market, essentially, that they know are not supposed to be and they think they're from this area. Mm -hmm. But they don't have any idea where. And I just love how everybody's like, pot hunters. Nobody around here would do that. Yeah, Wally plays dumb really well. <laughs> now Faye goes off to her date in Sop Choppy. And Panacea. Oh, wait. No, she goes to Sop Choppy first then. Oh, that's right. Yeah, she goes to Sop Choppy. She, she leaves for her date early to go do some research on Abigail mm-hmm. and then goes on her date. But yeah, she goes to the Sop Choppy Public Library, which Sop Choppy does not have a Doesn't public exist. library. It's in Wakulla County and there's one library for the entire county. Right. And it describes it as pull 
rolled into a four slot parking lot at the stop choppy library. It was housed in a teeny building, but it had internet access, so it wasn't teeny at all. I thought that was interesting because four spot parking lot, I don't think any of them are actually that small in the parking lots. All of our rural libraries that we have now, at least. Yeah. They've got probably dozen to 20 spots, you know, so they're not big still, but they're definitely more big than this sop choppy one that doesn't exist. Which makes sense because in these rural areas, libraries are like a central hub for so many different things. Yeah. And even though, you know, this was written in 2003, internet access is still a big one, especially for rural areas. Yeah. they It's really entertaining to see the descriptions of a 2003's book about the internet. Yeah. I like how internet is always spelled with a capital I. Capital I, I yes. <laughs> and talks about how it's kind of rare that this little teeny library has internet access, which I think is very feasible for that era in, this, in the rural areas yeah, of this time. Yeah, maybe. I will say now they all absolutely do. Yeah. It is definitely not a un uncommon thing in this area anymore. She's, she's trying to look up about Abby and she doesn't find anything more, really. She does find a yearbook from 1964 where Abby was a senior and she finds Douglas Everett in her class and she finds uh, Sheriff Mike was in their class and she finds Senator Cyril's older brother Cedric was in their class. Yes. So basically it confirms that all these individuals knew each other. And in these smaller ones, you probably had a class of a dozen. Yeah, and I basically. think, she, doesn't she find like Abby's senior portrait as well, where she's wearing the earring? Right. Yep. So she finally mm -hmm. gets to find the one with the earrings that does confirm in her mind, at least that this is the person. It's probably pretty solid. I don't know if it'll hold up in court, especially since she's been messing with it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, she also finds a photo of Cyril, Senator Cyril Kirby in the fourth grade. And this is when I start to realize maybe he's a little more interesting than he initially came off. Yeah, I think it changes the way Faye thinks a about him a little seemed, bit too, yeah. because in the photo, he looks kind of rough. He looks like a kid who's kind of been beaten up maybe and is on the lower end of the economic ladder. And the implications are abuse. Yeah, and so there's a scar on his brow. That's confirmed later that his father was abusive. Mm -hmm. He's missing a tooth. Tooth, and, he, yeah. and it looks like he had a broken nose or have has had a broken nose. Right. And that's interesting because, you know, she observes that he doesn't have a broken nose anymore. Right. So he's had co cosmetic surgery and she has kind of mixed feelings about that. But I mean, when you're suffering that trauma too, you do what you need to do, I think. Yeah. Yeah. There's that chapter. Anything else pop up out of this chapter? No, I just thought of it as more kind of character development. Yeah, it's a little more set up. Some of these are really dense as far as things that happen. And some of them are a little more like getting us ready for the, yeah. the breathing spaces, I suppose. Yeah. I think one of the more dense ones is chapter 14. And I love the beginning of this chapter just because... And I know you always joke how like Florida has a smell. Yeah. <laughs> and it talks about like the smell of the bahia grass waving in the muggy Florida breeze. And I was like, I love that smell. And you were probably like, yeah, Florida. Yeah. And there's something dead and rotten nearby, <laughs> <laughs> especially on a highway. <laughs> But this is the one where the date starts, essentially. Yes, they go to Panacea Mineral Springs Park, which is an actual place. Seems like an interesting place to me as a fellow woman to invite a man you barely know to come have lunch with you. Because it's even though it's on the highway, which she kind of talks about, it's on the highway, but it's also kind of isolated. Like it's very rare that you'll go there and there will, there will be somebody else there. Yeah, she knew no one would be there. Yeah, which to me, I'm like, girl, that's a reason not to meet him there. Right. <laughs> meet him at the barbecue place. Um, he brings barbecue. I guess she, you know, she's she was kind of thinking like, oh, I wonder. This was almost like a test. Mm -hmm. A series of tests. Yeah, yeah. I guess he passed. Yep. I did like, I like the descriptions of the park. Mm -hmm. And I looked up the park and it looks like pretty, like almost I wonder if the author's been there. Yeah, I've been there and it seemed pretty accurate. There's these little pools and they have little shelters over them. And I don't think anybody swims in them anymore, but... It used to be a resort. There used to be a hotel and things there. It's not there anymore, but it was where people would come and, you know, soak in the springs and cure from their ailments kind of place. And the way she described the shelters was that they were quite old. And from what I was finding online, it looks like there are remains of those shelters, but most of the ones currently there are much newer because they probably fell down and they just put up new ones or something. Yeah. But you can still find the remains of them. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But yeah, he passes the tests. Most of the tests is one of the two that he doesn't do quite as well with, but... He makes a few cringy remarks. 
Did you catch that? Uh, I'm not sure what you're talking about just yet. Oh, okay. Ahead. The general thrust of what she's testing here, I would say, is how elitist is he? Is he able to kind of put that aside? Yeah. And he definitely passes on that front. Yeah, he brings, you know, two clamshells of barbecue. He's not dressed. He doesn't worry about his vehicle on the, on the dirt road. road. Yeah. He puts his feet in the pool with her. Yeah. I didn't think it was just weird because she immediately starts referring to this as a date. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that he came to the library to find her. And even though, like, yes, we're talking about business, he's like brings invites her out to dinner. Like, I think that's very obviously that's what he intended. Right. Uh, yeah. It just like, I don't know. It, it seems weird to me, but that just might be my I also wouldn't invite a guy to meet me at a almost abandoned spring. So, yeah, <laughs> Faye and I are not the same. <laughs> Uh, what what comments? Oh, so when they were talking about the sweet tea. Oh, yeah. He makes a, a very cringy comment when they're talking about the sweet tea and says, I bet that is how you like your men, referring to them as sweet. And I was just like, ew. I don't, that didn't, for me, that didn't come off as sleazy so much as just like he's trying to be flirty and it wasn't very good. Well, kind of how I interpreted that at least. Yeah, I'm very, I'm still very like suspicious of this oh, man. I'm not totally convinced either, but he at least has potential he's not. <laughs> it's kind of what I was getting from all of this. Anyway, the date finishes with plans to have dinner at the pirate's lair, which we'll get to that in a little bit. Can't wait. Oh, yes. <laughs> Actually, so after this, we follow Cyril as he returns home to find his campaign manager is basically broken into his house. Yes. <laughs> and is chastising him about dating Faye because she had him followed. She's making good points and he acknowledges the points that she, Faye is not good for his campaign. No. He doesn't say this, but this is his internal monologue, which is one of the reasons I'm feeling a little more promising, maybe. He recognizes that Faye is beautiful, but he also values her cunning and intelligence. And I was like, okay, maybe he's got a little more going on here than just the shallow impressions we got when he when they first met right that's fair that's fair that's only because we have his eternal monologue at this point right so we turn to Faye's perspective at Joyous. she's doing dinner with joe she's working on her map room while he gets dinner ready i think yeah yeah she converted the butler's pantry into a map room which just sounds so lovely. And I guess she's trying to relocate the Turkey Foot Hotel. Yep. She thinks that if she can find that, she's got evidence that that was her, her land. Yeah. I guess she didn't really find anything, but maybe a couple of places where she might find some good artifacts. Oh, that's right. She's also looking for looting yeah. targets. We get some of her reflections on family and her family. This I found interesting because Joe starts asking some questions. Yeah. He's just been kind of quiet and just kind of there doing his own thing. But he starts to ask questions about how they ended up at Joyous mm -hmm. and, you know, just a little bit about her family history. And I thought it was a good way for the author to kind of give us some background information and develop Joe a little bit yeah. as well. Later on with Faye, she's kind of consoling her conscience about not revealing that she found Abby's body. And this is where we find out she's planning to go back and dig up Abby. Yes. And it just struck me as a very not smart thing to do. And I was like, girl, you can't help yourself, can right. you? <laughs> no. And she's not going to tell even Joe because it would upset him. So nobody's going to know she's out there. Yeah. There is a term that's used at this point called black market archaeologist. And I just have, I do not care for this term. Yeah. Looter. <laughs> yep. Yep. Because archaeologist is professional. It is, you're doing it to answer questions. These are not the same thing. You know, I've heard people call themselves like amateur archaeologists. And I sometimes will accept that is like, yes, OK, if they're like a volunteer that volunteers with like a local organization or something like that. Sure, you can call yourself like an amateur right. archaeologist if you want. But if you're out there looting and selling, selling, especially. you are not an archaeologist. No, no, no. Nope. But she, this is where she like goes to Joe. I didn't realize Joe wasn't even living in the house. He lives in like a little separate oh, shelter. That's what I understood, yeah. And um, she couldn't sleep. So she brought the journal, which it seems like anytime she can't sleep, <laughs> she right. pulls out the journal, which seems reasonable. This was a, the point where Mariah Whitehall. Right. And this is an interesting quote when she realizes this transition. If I can read it real quick. Sure. William Whitehall had been dead more than a century when she began reading this journal. He he was still dead, yet the fact that he had no more to say made her want to mourn him. I uh, thought that was interesting 
because one of the things I've observed and many people doing historic research have observed is that when you start to read these documents, you start to get a sense that you know this person. And so uh, I could see that almost mourning that person, even though they're not any more dead than they were when you started. Mm -hmm. um, I could see that being a thing for sure. Yeah. So William had stopped. We don't know why yet, but Mariah took up His the daughter. writing. Yeah. And Mariah at this point has a son named Andrew. And I guess she had never told him that her mother was Cree. Yeah. And I kind of had a fictional narrative about his father being French and a noble. Yeah. Yeah. You learn a little bit about slaves being brought to work on the plantation. I thought it was interesting that they called in the journal the islands referred to as Cat's Paw Island. And I was like, I wonder if it's Dog Island inspired. Uh, you know, right. I kind yeah. of got that connection there. Uh, Mariah was very against slavery and her son is not. What? He's turned out to be a real piece of work, basically. Yes. And it's interesting because in this journal entry, you find that Mariah kind of sees him almost as like as a lost soul. Yeah. Like she's well, I mean, just yeah. sorely disappointed kinda, in him. And kind of is like. Yeah. She wants to move out of the house. Wasn't even raised to this lifestyle. This is a lifestyle he has chosen. Yeah. Which is and extra And it's because horrendous. of the profit. Right. It's all about the money on human. Yeah. He even sees that. He says that, you know, the profit comes from when you increase your number of slaves. Right. And meaning the children of slaves. And we learn that Mariah doesn't even want to live in the house. So she wants to move out. And this is where you get into some of the gender roles of the time where, you know, women didn't have their own money, their own land. They didn't have a lot. So everything she does is kind of at the because her her son is allowing her to do it within reason. Well, he's basically her caretaker. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, how are you going to build a cabin? You don't, where are you going to live? But she... You're going to have to have my slaves do it for yeah, you. Yeah, and she doesn't want to have the slaves do it, but she pays them with uh, some silver, her mother's silver. Initially with trinkets. Yeah. Uh, like valuable trinkets. Yeah, and then she starts paying them and learning, teaching right. them. And I thought it was interesting that the slaves were started giving her gifts and she felt obviously uncomfortable, but didn't want to be rude. So she accepted them. And this is where we learn about the Clovis point. It was apparently given to her by one of the slaves whom she was teaching. The enslaved person told her that they knew where the Clovis site was. Yes. Yeah. Yes. She goes out and visits the Clovis site and there's talk about pottery, which mm. I mean, at first I was like, Clovis didn't have pottery. But eventually we find out that there is a multi, what we call a multi-component site. So essentially yeah. we have a later Native American group living in the same place, more yeah. or less in the same place. Yeah. So that worked out. But I was like, for a moment, like, uh-oh. <laughs> well, I would clarify, we haven't, uh, pottery at Clovis sites doesn't mean that they didn't necessarily have it. All current evidence in scientific understanding, which, you know, with the way science works, because the, the evidence says that right now, that is the way it is, is that pottery in North America was invented uh, about 5000 BC. So that is quite a bit Later. after the yeah. Clovis. Okay, so next we move on to chapter 15. Okay, so here we learn about Kelly Bergdahl, I guess is how you pronounce her last name. She runs the law enforcement forensics lab. And I like the way they talk about how she like comes in early to do her work before all the distractions. And then, of course, Sheriff Mike McKenzie learns that she comes in early to do things before all the distractions. So, of course, he's calling her early knowing she's there. Yeah, I feel like that's how that would go if your whole point was to come in early to avoid distractions. Um, everybody would know you're there. And it seems like they did find some evidence uh, from the, the murder site of the two students but nothing that really has yeah. been useful. So basically, as I understand is the fact that they found anything is amazing right. in this situation, but what they did find isn't going to help them at all. Right, yeah. Because they don't even know why someone would have done that. They don't even have a hint at the motive at this point. They found a footprint. They found some fibers from clothing. They found some hairs with no DNA traces, and they found the bullets. Yeah. But they have no fingerprints, and the footprint is a cheap shoe, and they suspect respect the person brought gloves. So essentially, they think that even like the footprint's probably not that useful. Yeah, nothing's really like... The footprint does suggest a man. I yeah. that's the only thing. Yeah, but nothing's like particularly unique or anything like the fibers could be from like the students being out there and right. stuff. It's just hard to say. Nothing's really leading to anything. And then we move on to Faye to commit to her wise decision to dig up Abby. 
and she arrives to find that the body has been taken and bleach has been poured on the ground to eliminate DNA. I don't know if that actually works, but I could see that actually working. I mean, it works in all the TV shows. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that's for real. Right. But she digs anyway. Yeah. At this point, I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. I Get thought it was interesting, there. too. The one thing that really stuck out to me is, you know, she makes a makeshift little mask out of toilet paper yeah. <laughs> and uh, wears rubber gloves. And she and it mentions that she always digs in rubber gloves. And I'm like, who digs with rubber gloves? Well, if you're doing a crime, I think. I guess maybe. But if you're that worried, don't do it. Well, like, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, oh, goodness. But yeah, I thought it was strange, especially like if she, I don't know, archaeologists don't wear like rubber gloves. when She's not sifting in the dirt and stuff, too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're in a caustic situation where there's bleach in the soil, then that would make sense. But otherwise, you know, but she found the culprit hadn't gone deep enough, which actually I observed is not uncommon with looters either. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that in a few cases, looters. It happened in uh, our last book several times. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen it personally where they didn't go deep enough and there's, well, I'm glad they didn't, you know, but uh, (laughs) they missed a lot of it because of that. So at the bottom of the grave, underneath where the body had been, she finds a silver necklace and something too big to be one of the earrings, but she has to clean it off to find out more. She's already disturbing a crime scene, but as an archaeologist, judging an archaeologist, it really bugged me that she felt she had to pry open that watch right at this point. Oh, me too. Yeah, I'm glad you were bothered by that too. I was like, okay, so she finds these things and then she damages them. And you you might, if you listen back to our talk about the dig, there's a scene where one of the archaeologists kind of gets a little overeager and makes a mistake as well. But I feel like there's a pretty big gap between doing archaeology and making a mistake and messing around when you know you shouldn't be. And then, then, yeah, and an archaeological site to yeah. you know yeah anyway so inside uh she finds an inscription i liked how the description was displayed because that is actually how we would write it out mm-hmm. if we couldn't read it she puzzles together that the inscription inside the watch is jerobram everett blessed assurance ame church 25 years service basically mm-hmm. and so jeb was douglas's dad yes yes who she knows died before Abby's disappearance. So it then... It would implicate Douglas. Right. Like it would be in his possession potentially. Right. That's an assumption, but it's it's a, a starting point. It's a fair point. one. Right. Yeah. Well, it's a starting point. You yeah. know, it wouldn't be a court case, the thing necessarily. Right. And at this point, she finally realizes that she probably shouldn't be doing this. And I'm like... Mm. <laughs> If only she'd had Joe with her. Like, I feel like he would have had the sense to say, hey. So she's getting out of there and radios into Wally's to see if there are any messages. And it turns out Douglas Everett wants to meet her urgently at his beach house. And and I'm like, Faye, you just figured out you're making a bad decision. So let's go make let's another. Let's go make another one. <laughs> Although to be fair. Fair a little bit. Her reasoning for why this is probably safe isn't the worst. Um, the idea being like he can't know she was out there. Right. Leaving a message and radioing out to her over an open frequency is not a good way to plan a murder. Right. That's but true. But yeah. you're still suspecting this person. And you're going to be alone in his house. That yeah. doesn't seem like you're just digging a hole. Right. Deep, deep hole. Um, we find out Douglas has money trouble, and his wife thinks it's mistresses, but he says it's worse. But I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> the only information we have so far is him buying black market artifacts. Yeah, again, another little mystery yeah, in I, here. We don't know exactly what's going is on. The implication is there's something else going on. Yeah. Like gambling or something. Yeah. So this is where it gets interesting. Faye arrives at his boathouse and he has a Clovis point. And essentially we find out that he bought it and a whole bunch of other artifacts to protect her because he assumed that it was her selling the artifacts. And I thought this part was interesting too because it talks about like... Oh, well, you could just donate them to a museum for a tax donation, which we talked a yeah, little bit about yeah, in like our that. last. But then also how he says that because of how old the site was, that they would land in jail even longer. Mm-hmm. Did you catch that? Yeah. And I was like, that's not how that works how that either. Works. It doesn't matter how old the site is. The law doesn't protect, you know, different period sites in different ways. Right. It's a blanket 
coverage law. I don't know what you want to call right. it, but it just especially on federal lands. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter how old or how early the site is. If it's an archaeological site and you loot it and you get caught. And there's another a quote here that I thought was interesting. Faye was thrilled. Then the anger penetrated everything. These times might have taken proof of human occupation in Florida back thousands of years if they'd been documented in context. As it was, they were a pile of really cool junk. Yeah, the cognitive dissonance there, uh -huh. Faye. <laughs> yeah, so, some, so the implication here is that this site is of untold Native American stories is more important than the untold stories of all the enslaved people that she's investigating. Yeah. And is this where she starts to qualify? Yeah, sure, she'd skirted laws protecting lands to retrieve things she considered to be her family's buried heirlooms. But she'd done no great harm, not to the islands themselves and not to the archaeological record. Yes, you have. Right. <laughs> she had dug up nothing of great intrinsic cultural value. Yes, yes you, you have. have. <laughs> she had seen to it that her most interesting finds were housed in a museum. And we've talked about how that is not what archaeology is about. Right. And she documented every step in field notebooks just in case she was wrong about a site's importance. And I had a little mini rant in my notes about this. As you can tell by Barbara and I, I think we are both very unhappy with this point of view. Yeah, Faye is uh, not doing herself any favors by trying to justify herself to us. Nope. <laughs> Especially, I feel like, and we'll get into this, I think, in the next chapter a bit more, too. It feels to me like she's trying to draw a line between what she's doing and what these other people are doing. Yeah. And she's having to put too much work into it, which should probably tell her something. Right. Yes. Yes. At this point, uh, she kind of storms off and decides, oh, and makes yet another smart decision and decides she's going to go look for the Clovis site. And she thinks she knows where it's at because of the journal entry. Right. Okay. Chapter 16. We're with Faye and we're out at Water Island, which I noted was a very inventive name for an island. <laughs> but I do like the way it opens where she is looking at the landscape mm -hmm. to try and find where to dig. And she finds a sizable live oak suggesting, you know, it had been there for a while. Several of them, I think. These islands, barrier islands, they kind of come and go move a little bit change there a little bit they don't they're not a stagnant thing so for a larger live oak to be there that means that that piece of that island is probably fairly old and intact and that is how archaeologists think about the landscape when they look at it we'll look at things like plants and other features to see how disturbed the property might be or where the good soils might be and things like that so i like that part because it does kind of show insight into her archaeological brain mm -hmm. or looter brain or looter she's brain it, using it for both right yes so she goes to investigate them and finds the looter pits and she's flabbergasted by the damage. Yes. Which, which she was there to do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, but she's she's better about it, apparently. I don't know. <laughs> she finds pottery, which we talked about, and then she identifies it as Fort Walton culture. Fort yeah, Walton culture. I thought it was interesting because they mentioned that they're only typically found inland and the Fort Walton culture extends from the coast into like southern tips of Alabama and Georgia. In fact, there's a mound in Fort Walton. No, oh, yeah. That it's is named after that. Fairly coastal, I would say. Yeah, yeah. That is like the namesake for this culture period. And it was first identified by Gordon Willie at that site in Fort Walton Beach. So you do find these this type of pottery in coastal areas. But anyway. Not the end of the world, if that's a little off, but yeah, definitely not a quite correct. And then she figures that the Clovis site must have been out in the water. She sees the scuba gear, which again, that, that could make sense. The Our coast now is not the right. coast of the past. Yeah. And a lot of the early sites, especially along the coast, are underwater. But I was like, girl, you know, I scuba dive. I know how expensive that stuff is. People don't just leave it laying around on an island. Right. And it never even occurred to her that, hey, somebody might be here. Yeah. There is a little bit a nice talk about how difficult it is to find prehistoric sites mm -hmm. because there's fewer materials that last long term. Although so I mentioned stone and bone, I did note that it doesn't quite acknowledge uh, features. But right. it, so it's focused on the, the art. Artifacts, artifacts but there are definitely features house pits cellars fire pits these things are, are features uh, post holes are all features that we do find at these sites it's a minor thing again but something i figured i'd add and then yes and then she finds out that she's maybe not alone which duh duh <laughs> 
<laughs> so she kicks a gasoline powered pump and it explodes. At first I was like, what? I know. Yeah. <laughs> the seventies cop movie nonsense right. is this. It turns out a bullet had hit it right as she did that basically. Yes. And so she's not shot, but she's a little injured. Yeah. I guess a piece of the pump may have hurt her or something. Oh uh, Yeah. There's, there's a few things going on with her leg basically. Yeah. And this part I was like, ah, what is happening? Because the shooter was in a tree, but then gets in a fist fight. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, okay, so there's two people on the island. Who are these people? What is going on? It was kind of chaotic there for yeah. a brief moment. It communicated that very well, though, I would say. Yeah, no, it, it I mean, I feel like it kind of puts you in the frame of mind but they she would have the been in. the gun drop out of the tree. Right. And she books it. <laughs> yeah. And during this, I observed again, you know, just how hard she's working to convince herself that she's not like these people. Right. And like, I'm still not convinced here. Yeah. So she gets out of there and then we cut to Wally, who we find out was the person who attacked the guy in the tree who was Nguyen. And so they have an altercation and basically he seems to be convincing himself that he's protecting her, but he's also ha making a point to Nguyen that we can't kill her because she's our scapegoat. Yeah. So I'm not sure how honest he's even being with himself in this situation. I feel like he's conflicted because like he has a personal relationship with her too, which... But he's definitely okay with letting her go to prison. Yeah, right. Just not that he doesn't want her dead. He just right. wants her incarcerated. Right. <laughs> We cut to Magda, and this is interesting. She describes archaeologists as technology hating, which maybe 2003, I could see that being a bit more, but that's definitely not the case anymore. Yeah. We've been actually working to kind of counter some of this idea. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it also might be a generational thing to right. a bit. Well, I mean, she's talking in this about how emails have changed in your office communication. Like, so again, this is bringing you back to 2003. Mm -hmm. And so the emails this morning are all about the artifacts being sold on email eBay, which is still a problem. Yes. And now Magda is having to confront some of her suspicions about Faye because she knows that Faye could be the person doing this possibly. Yeah. And she's always, I guess, had some idea that Faye might be doing some looting on the side. Yep. And so now she's like, well, I got to confront this now. <laughs> this, okay, so uh, all the rap we're giving Faye about her cognitive dissonance in this one, she gets back to bed and there's a quote here. If people found out about the Clovis site and what was going on there, people would believe that she had desecrated the past for money. Like, you, you did. Right, yes. Not maybe this past or this site, but you absolutely did. Yeah, that's just the whole reason she's mind. looting is to be able to pay her property right. taxes. And the implication that that the stories are more the the archaeology is more important because it's older is nonsense. Yeah, no, I I, I that, that as a historic me. archaeologist, well, and, it annoys me too. You know, again, and there's all the archaeology like we talked about in Small Things Forgotten about how important African American right. and enslaved archaeology is to understanding the past in a more full and more complete way. Yes. It's not less important. So I mm, <laughs> it really got mm -hmm. me, my goat this round. So she lies in bed bleeding and she pulls out the journal to read. We go over to um, Mariah again and we find out her son, Andrew, is again a real piece of work. He's married and mistreats his wife and blames her for not having children, which is not an uncommon thing, unfortunately. And then on Christmas, he tried to give his mother a slave. Yeah. Which had to be a power move. Because, yeah, it just... And it's also maybe trying to hide his... I think that's part of it, too, because, we, yeah, we find out that the slave is pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so this person's name is uh, Julia. Julia, yeah. And I thought it was interesting, too, because Julia is a slave. Right. But I guess Mariah and her do form a type of companionship, it seems. But this is also written from Mariah's perspective. Right. So I would wonder how Julia would feel their companionship was like. And Mariah wanted to free her, but wasn't allowed to basically. Yeah. So that's maybe a minor detail from Julia's perspective, but that is a detail at least. Yes. Um, so the baby is born and it's very obvious that the baby is Andrews. And the name of the baby is Callie, which Callie. is significant to... Which is Faye's ancestor who inherited Joyous. Yes, yeah. Uh, so throughout this chapter and maybe the next one, essentially we cut back to Magda a bunch doing research on Faye. Mm -hmm. We go back to Faye who is putting Abby's necklace into a jar of dilute formic acid. I noted removing any remaining DNA evidence that could be on yeah. there. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> um, this is not necessarily bad practice for cleaning an artifact, especially if you know the materials involved. It can get corrosion off very nicely, although I'm not sure about silver as much. Yeah, I was wondering about that too. Just Silver doesn't usually concrete as much, but it can if the soils do that. Yeah. So it's very possible. Yeah. But, you know, dilute, it would allow that to soften up and you can pull it off in theory without damaging the artifact. Yeah. In reality, an archaeologist would never do that on their own. I don't think they would send it to a specialist typically to have that done. And so the specialist could make sure they're doing the right processes and doing it more carefully. And they would make sure it wasn't part of a crime scene. (laughs) (laughs) She's doing a lot more mental gymnastics here about justifying her actions. Yeah. It said earlier that she's not done anything important, but here we find out she's excavated old privies and foundations of slave cabins. I'm like, I was like, a privy. I love privies. And I know people are probably like, ooh, gross. <laughs> but yeah, we find a lot of cool things down in a privy. They didn't have garbage collections, so they would throw their trash away wherever they could. And what better place than a privy, right? I remember I was working on a site and we actually found a pair of glasses and you can just imagine they they were perfect. They didn't have any damage even after being dropped in a privy. And you can imagine somebody losing their glasses in rural Florida down the privy and being like, oh, no. Right. I guess those are gone. Yeah. The liquor bottles and quote unquote medicine bottles. And, you know, a lot of stuff gets thrown down them. Yeah. I like when other people excavate privies. (laughs) Quite often they're old enough, it doesn't matter, but not always. Right. Yeah. But yeah, she was digging in all this stuff that is just a wealth of potential information. And foundation of slave cabins. Yeah. That one really got me, even more than the previous. Yeah. Like. And trash piles, like. Yeah. Like, oh, girl. Well, and from a legal point of view, again, to reiterate, most of what she's talking about here is on. She actually does own. Yeah. So it is, she is legally OK to do it. But as an archaeologist, trying to convince herself that this is less important is a problem. Yeah. All right. Magda finds architecture of late 18th and early 19th century tabby dwelling houses the book. I guess she was looking for... She's looking through like, books Faye had checked out. Yeah, to try and figure out what Faye was researching to try and get a, you know clues as to what Faye was up to. And she found, you know, your typical books that you would expect, like books on Native American culture and plantation archaeology. But yeah, the architectural preservation one was a little suspicious. Yeah. Cut to Cyril also doing his own research on Faye and her situation. And at this point, I, I realized and kind of appreciate how much of this mystery novel revolves around people doing documentary research. Yeah, that's true. Because there's a lot of it and yeah. it's not it's well done. I gotta say it's not boring. It doesn't spend a lot of time on it. No, but like we always tell people a lot of what archaeologists do is background research before you even go out onto a site you're doing research. Well, just crime investigation or, you know, PI work or something before you can take any action, you have to have your evidence. Right. So I like that. And it shows some of the processes that we would actually do as well. Mm-hmm. We cut back to Liz at Wally's, who is observing Nguyen and doesn't care for him. Basically, she's seen a lot of, interacted with a lot of shady people, and he's shadier than most. Kind of what it comes down to. She knows he's a diver because he always brings in tanks and he walks like a diver, like someone wearing flippers. And so I thought that was interesting because I know a lot of divers and I've never noticed them to walk like they've got clown shoes on. No. Yeah, I was thinking that too. And I was thinking too, like when you have flippers on, most of that time is going to be in the water. Yeah, you don't want to walk with them. You're not going to be walking around with them much. Now he's diving from the shore and most of the ones I know are diving from boats. You still usually like walk in and then get like in, you know, water where you can kind of put them on. I can't, you'd have to like walk backwards. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to walk forwards with them. Yeah, the and some people do walk backwards with them. It's yeah. just easier to me to put them on once you're in the water. Right. But yeah, I thought that was interesting. Um, basically, Nguyen is creepy. Yeah. We also get a bit of a wild man local legend. I would love to know the author's inspiration for this because, so yeah, these teenagers are like sitting around as teenagers would just talking about this local lore about a wild man who lives in the woods and is usually up to no good or whatever. and 
I wonder the inspiration for that, because there is a local kind of lore. It doesn't really fit with this, but it's about a man named C.B. Tate who went into the woods and came out of the woods all scared because of what he went through in the woods. Now that part of the forest is called Tate's Hell because he came out saying he He's been through hell. Yeah. Doesn't really fit with the wild man legend, but I'm wondering if like that kind of inspired her to come up with like a little local lore. And this one didn't register with me as important until it came up again in a right. later chapter. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. So maybe I should take note of this and and this is going to actually but be... But Nguyen, how do you say it? Nguyen is how I say it. Nguyen? Yeah. He suggests that the wild man was the one that shot the archaeology students. So. Right. He also points out the archaeology students are about as old as the teenagers. Yeah. Which is, you know, creepy, veiled threats almost, but no reason. It's just, just really... Just being a weird dude. Just being a weird dude. Yeah. Not being likable. Yeah. And I like... This is where you kind of learn how much this case is kind of bothering Sheriff Mike. And I go back and forth on what I think of him. Sometimes he seems like he's kind of a doofus. But then also sometimes I'm like, he is doing the best he can with what he's been given. Like, if you think about it, I'm sure they don't get a lot of double murder. Mm -hmm. in this area but you can tell he's like really passionate really wants to try and figure out what's going on and who killed these two students but I'm kind of liking the development of Mike mm -hmm. for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> he, well, he's not a perfect character, but he's an interesting right. one. Yeah. Back to Magda. She's in the Dwellings book, and this is where she finds that they're mostly along the Atlantic coast, not something we see in this portion of the Gulf, which yeah. I thought, okay, that's good. We talked about that last time. Um, so that makes this an unusual structure that Faye has and maybe more recognizable. Right, right. exactly. Back to Faye. She's getting ready for her date. She checks on the necklace and finds the initial CSS. And she also decides that she's going to repair it and wear it for her date. No, no, no. Those are two different necklaces. You sure? Yeah. The necklace, the CSS one is one she, that is not the one she found in the grave. The one she found in the grave is the St. Christopher's medal. Right, right. Okay, thank you. I had that wrong. Yes. So the one she's going to wear is one that she found on her property somewhere. Yeah. And she says she bought it. Well, she tells Cyril that. Yeah. She found it on her property. Though. Yeah. She found it on her property. But she didn't find it in someone's grave. That is important. Yeah. And I've had forgotten that. Thank you. Yeah. The one she's cleaning, which she, as she's like getting ready for the date, she like, I can imagine her just kind of like shaking the jar, seeing how it's getting along in um, the solution. And I guess this is when it's revealed. She can kind of see enough of it that it's a St. Christopher's medal, a Catholic medal. It also had the Virgin Mary on it. it seems like a very complex mm -hmm. St. medal compared to what I have seen. And so she wondered if Abby was Catholic, but in her obituary, it mentions that the reverend who did the memorial service was from a Methodist church. So she's like, huh. And Everett, his father was a member of the a AME, AME church, church yeah. which is not Catholic. Yeah. So then it becomes, who is this? I love this quote, though. She she just, just assumed the girl was Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian, like just about everybody in that part of the world where the Bible Belt devoted itself to holding up the pants of the nation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she decides not to push Everett on this right now. Uh, we finish off the chapter again with what I consider to be storm vision. So the impending hurricane. Yes, I, I do like that. There seems to be a lot of foreshadowing in this book, but you're never quite sure. Like you're like, oh, that has to be foreshadowing, but you don't know where it's going. Right. And I do enjoy that. It keeps me reading. And so in 18, in chapter 18, we start off going to their restaurant, which is called the Pirate's Lair, which is housed in an actual pirate's lair and it's fancy. And I, I put like, I was like, it's it's a nice restaurant and an actual pirate's lair, whatever that means. <laughs> and, yeah, I just did LOL after that. <laughs> Because, A, there was there no pirates in this area. There are a few pirate stories. Most of them are made up in more recent times, even. Yeah. Also, I don't think you're likely to find what you might consider a fancy restaurant in this part of the panhandle. There are plenty of nice restaurants that are very comfortable, but, you know, Ethiopian style I vegetables. Was thinking, I was like, I wish there was a restaurant on the coast that would have something like Ethiopian. Right. So I thought this was completely fiction, basically. It's yeah. fine. You're but looking I at thought I was amused fried by that. seafood, overpriced po' boys. <laughs> yeah, po' boys that aren't French from po' fries, boys. French fries, coconut shrimp if you're fancy. <laughs> yep. Oysters, that kind of yep. thing. But yeah, a lot of Southern food, a lot of 
seafood. It seems like they're having a good conversation and meal. Like they're they're getting along nice, having a nice time. And then at some point, Cyril crosses himself, in which I said balls. <laughs> because I knew exactly what that meant. Yeah. We just talked about looking for a Catholic. And I thought this was going to be like a foreshadowing that we're going to have to sit on for a few chapters. I know. But I was no. like, the book is like, is. nope, she makes that connection. I mean, I appreciate that. It almost treats us like intelligent readers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it wasn't dropped as a hint for us to stew on. Um, she follows, makes that connection right away, too. And I guess his brother's name or nickname was Criss Cross. Yep. She saw that in the yearbook. Uh, yeah, in the yearbook. Yep. I guess maybe it refers to him making sign of the cross. I don't right. know. Um, that's what it kind of implies. And yeah. so being on oil fields for seven days on and, and seven days off would be easy to kind of be not around and disappear. Yeah. And so she's making the connection that, and she knows Cedric would have known Abby. So she's making the connection that Cedric may be the killer or one of the killers or something. I've also personally, it's not been brought up in the book, but I personally not crossed off the father either. Yeah, same. Even though it's almost, maybe it's a little more suspicious. It's not been brought up in the book. Well, like we know he was violent. Right. Oh, yeah. She, so while they're sitting there having their lovely date at the pirate's lair, she realizes that he's not really hiding their, I guess you could, their date, their date. You know, he's brought her to a public place as he's walking around. People are nodding and saying hi to him, kind of, you know, waiter, acknowledging his existence. The waiter calls him Senator Kirby. Yeah, yeah. And so she realizes that he's not worried about being seen out with her, which remember going back a couple chapters where Alice, his campaign manager, didn't want him to be seen with her. Right. So that will be interesting to see how that plays out. I found it a little interesting that or suspicious that she was so cer certain that Cedric was a potential culprit because certainly there are the Catholics in town, right? And just because you know he know he knew Abby doesn't mean he's the only Catholic that knew Abby. That's right? true. They would definitely, I mean, there probably is more Catholics, but there's probably not as many of them as, it, it definitely, I would think, probably narrow smaller, down the pool but, in this area. Yeah. Like we said, there's at least probably one more. Anyway. Cut back to Magda again, and she's now in the Historic American Building Survey. Which I love that they bring in the HAB survey, or HABS. I guess HAB survey is redundant, even though I always say that. But it was a New Deal program by FDR, and it was essentially he hired, or the program hired a bunch of people to document old historic buildings. Um, and it's become a really, really useful tool for historic research. Including, and it's useful for preservation because yeah. many of them are gone now. And part of the motivation was to give people jobs basically yeah this kind yeah of yeah same with and they talk about a little while later they talk about another new deal program that will bring up when the time comes oh and she does mention like how you know it's really hard because the catalog only lists what is recorded well now a lot of this stuff can actually be found on the library of congress's website so a lot more of it, this is another way this book's kind of showing its date mm -hmm. um now you can find a lot of that information just by googling on the internet lowercase i yes <laughs> the World Wide Web, even. <laughs> Faye is back at Joyous, hanging out at basically the, the family cemetery, um, which is on the island, which makes sense, is very common. And I thought this was interesting because it says, you know, that there's several generations of women that lay in the ground on that island, including, I guess, Mariah. And then there's also Andrew, Courtney, William and Susan. But or wait, Susan had been lost during the great Apalachicola hurricanes of 1886. Mm -hmm. And so me being a nerd, I had to Google hurricanes 1886. And that was historically one of the most significant hurricane seasons in the Gulf. Uh, Florida had three storms, three significant storms hit Florida before August. Boy. Yeah. And that hasn't been seen since 1886. And there was one that actually did hit near where this book takes place. Okay. So now you know. She also checked Cedric's photo in the yearbook and found that he was wearing a necklace. Like, yes, that's so that, right. That was like, okay. Yes. That does imply him a little bit more strongly. And then before going back to bed, she's looking at the journal again. And there's no more entries, but there's a lot of stuff that's been stuck in, including a photo of unknown people. And finally, an excerpt from the Federal Writers Project. Yeah, which is another one of those FDR New Deal programs that they hired locals to go out and interview former slaves. And in this instance, uh, one of those interviews was with 
Alley. In 1935. Yes. And I just love how she incorporated, the author incorporated both Habs and the Federal Writers Project. Yeah. Good little gems there. Agreed. But the oral history with Callie talks about the hurricane, a hurricane, and remember this is much later than 1886, so don't get those, all those hurricanes confused, washed away the hotel and the white people that were, and their slaves that were staying in the hotel. And I thought this was kind of interesting how like Callie kind of talks about how she had premonitions of this happening in her dreams and she was conflicted about like warning the people, but they probably wouldn't have listened to her anyways. And then she also talks about typhoid fever, which that and many other fevers were a concern in this swampy, lovely area we call Florida. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Do you have anything else to add? No, not at this point. Sounds like you got it. All right. On to chapter 19. Chapter 19. Faye at Joyous. She's kind of blubbering to Joe about her date, seems like. Poor Joe. <laughs> yeah. And so he's clearly, again, it's clear he doesn't like Cyril. Um, his motivation is not entirely clear. But while she's talking to him, he's actually using stone arrows for target practice on a stump, which I thought was interesting because you usually wouldn't use stone points for target practice on a hard target. You're going to destroy them every time you hit. But that's a minor detail. Joe's not hiding that he doesn't like Cyril, though. I don't know that Faye's picked up on that. I don't. Somehow. I think she's in her own little world, her little la la land. Assumptions about Joe and isn't picking up on this. It's interesting to me because, like, to this point, Joe's been kind of made out to be like a little bit naive, right? Right. And, but I feel like this brings out the naivety in Faye when it comes to like love and relationships mm -hmm. and stuff. She's just kind or of in family, her little. At the very least, yeah. You know, she hasn't had a lot of that. Yeah, she's in her own little la la land. You know, she's not a teenager, but she the way she's kind of thinking of this relationship and stuff is very like how like a teenager young girl would. They do acknowledge that at one point that she's aware too that she's in the, the honeymoon phase with yeah. the relationship being all exciting and everything. We head to Sop Choppy again for the library and she's going to try and find out where Cedric Kirby is. Um, and this is where she goes to the World Wide Web and it describes the click whir beep of when she goes online. So we know that they're on dial-up, which <laughs> for a rural library internet connection at the time, I bet it would be. Yeah. Uh, she doesn't find any leads for herself. She does find a online website that will do the research for her for 35 bucks. And the, I love the note, website's name. We find them. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds legit. Yeah. Basically, they don't find anything, but they, you know, give good evidence for all the looking they did. And there's a little line that on the value of negative information, which... I knew I was like, Tristan's going to love that line. I like that line. The wild man story comes up again. And here she's wondering if the wild man isn't Cedric Kirby or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it seems like even she doesn't believe that. And it feels, feels a little far-fetched right now. And so she heads back and she gets a radio from Wally that Magda has been calling. And we, I like this because I'm like, oh, she's going to like set up a meeting and she's going to get her or something. But no, they're actually going back out to see Green Island to continue the investigation. Yeah. Yeah, the sheriff, I guess, has opened up the island since there's no useful evidence that's Which come from the investigation. They say it to each other. It means he's given up on finding who, who it was. Right. Which got to be rough. Yeah. And you can tell like this is really weighing on Magna. Magna. Sorry, yeah. guys. <laughs> it's weighing on everyone who's close to them, basically. Yeah. Sheriff, everyone. We go back to Wally. He's meeting with Nguyen in his office. And we find out that he has been selling the things they've been excavating, which we pretty well knew, I think. We also find out that the stuff on Joyous Island in that shed, that it's supposed to be from his divorce, is actually looted artifacts. Knew which, it! Which again, we kind of had that figured out, I think. Ha! Yep. We saw right through you, Wally. Yeah, you and your shady dealings. And they really want to get out there and sell them, but he can't because Joe's basically there right. all the time, or he doesn't know when he's gone, I think, more importantly. And he also doesn't want, Wally doesn't, wants to keep the location of his artifacts concealed kind of as an upper hand, I guess. Right. So he doesn't necessarily want anybody else to know, right. including his shady business partner. Well, I think his shady business partner is the one that has him mostly worried. Yeah. Well. So they talk about how they're going. Well, there's kind of a deadline too. I thought this was interesting. It added a little nuance to this situation because he has a profitable side business looting artifacts and the resort they want to build at Sea Green will bring him business, but he's going to have to stop his looting business 
there's going to be too many people around, I think, is the idea. Yeah. So there's a deadline for him on this effort. Yeah. And so they talk about getting rid of Joe somehow. And in the meantime, Faye's leg is festering. Yep. <laughs> and she doesn't want to go to the doctor. She can't afford to. She doesn't have money. She doesn't have insurance. Yada, yada, yada. We all know that story. Right. And I feel like this is going to come into play somehow later on. I don't know how, but something's going to happen that has to deal with her leg wound because we keep coming back to it. Yep. And then we go to continue Callie's story back from 1935. Callie talks about the second Mrs. I think she means Andrew must have remarried at some point. Yeah, yeah. I was a little unclear on that, but I think that's what I figured out. We also find out that Callie was fully aware Andrew was her father and also uh, basically straight up says Andrew assaults her as well. Mm -hmm. It's a little hard to read, to be honest. Yeah, it was really heartbreaking. Yeah. She references Mr. Courtney, who is the missus's son. So this is when I figure, oh, we're talking about a second wife who's had a son with another marriage is basically what and happened. And I believe here. another Courtney too because I, I could be wrong but I feel like at the beginning of the book there was in the long line of women in Faye's family there was a woman named Courtney but I don't know if that'll come into play later. Okay. But Courtney Andrew's son bought a plantation called Innisfree mm -hmm. near Quincy which is a real place. It's just west of Tallahassee and it's next to one of his father's tobacco plantations which Shade Tobacco was really big business, especially in Havana, which is a smaller community just outside of Quincy. So that's accurate historically. There's a lot of local legends about how he treats his enslaved people like people, I yeah. guess. Yeah, Courtney, not Andrew. Courtney, yes. Callie knows that that's legend, but she does know that he is thinking of freeing the slaves. Yeah. So he is maybe, you don't know. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Right. Because obviously Andrew is not going to be happy about that. <laughs> well, Andrew doesn't have a say over Courtney's. Right. But how that it, it'll be interesting to see the family dynamics that occur if they're even discussed in the journal entries and stuff. But right. yep. OK. And then the last chapter. Oh, this me. chapter. Already. So chapter 20. Well, this is when we come back to Sea Green Island and opened up that so the field crew is reassembled on a day's notice. I guess, you know, they see the finishing this job as kind of a way to honor their classmates who were murdered, I guess what's implied. I like the discussion about, you know, they're all out there working and Magda's kind of rubbing her shoulder. She has an injury and I was like, I feel like every field archaeologist can relate. I feel um, like the emphasis is fully on like shoulder injuries, which, it, yeah. which I'm sure there are archaeologists with those, but I think it's it's not just shoulders. No, mine is my hip. Mine is my knees. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yes, basically field work is very hard on the body. Yeah. Um, you don't realize it because you're not digging as fast as you possibly can. But because I feel like sometimes because we're digging slower and maybe not digging in as efficient as possible way. Yeah. It is harder than you think it is on and the body. It's day in, day out. It's a lot of repetitive motion, yeah. which is what got me a lot of the mm -hmm. time, too. Yeah. I mean, I was in great shape. Yeah, physically well, but except for the injuries yeah <laughs> except for the injuries right and you and this is when you find like magda is still very bothered and i thought it was interesting that she mentions it, it seems like she went to a doctor maybe a therapist or something to discuss like hey she needed sleep she can't sleep and stuff and like the doctor won't prescribe or something so like a little hint of like mental health Right. In there. PTSD. That, yeah, that isn't being dealt with properly. We also have that Faye is starting to limp because of the injured leg. Yes. I thought this was funny because no one's asked, but she thought of the excuse that's an old basketball injury. And like, we just had a whole discussion about field injuries. <laughs> just, I know. Just yeah. Say it was yeah, an old just field say, injury. Yeah, like, exactly. You're on survey and you fell and hurt your knee and, you yeah. know, and it's been bothering you. Tripped over a root. <laughs> but oh well. They have a deputy on site for protection, which I think we probably would in that scenario. Oh, I would hope so. If we're back at all. Yeah. I like the quote, unless they dug up something comparable to King Tut's tomb or Machu Picchu, this tangled spot of wildness would soon be a tamely exotic vacation destination. And I was like, I'm kind of glad she threw that in there. Right. A lot of times, like, it's very rare that archaeology is going to stop development. So I'm glad they put that in there. 
So archaeologically speaking, as far as the fine details about how archaeology has been done, I would say this book has been very impressive so far. But in this chapter, there are a few things that uh, it seems to be a little more condensed in this chapter than some of the other ones. So here, Faye feels that they're digging in the wrong place. And so she just starts digging under a tree. Right. I'm like, no, no, no. Just no. willy nilly, wherever. But that would not fly. Yeah. Like, there's a coordinate system. You have to map in and make sure you know exactly where you're digging. You need to consult with your PI. You need to map where you're going to be digging so that's it's on the site map. You know, the PI is in charge. They get to tell you, no, we don't have time for that. You need to be digging on, on this yeah. other thing. So you don't get to dig wherever you want just because your archaeology right. spidey sense says you should be digging somewhere. So a way that this could have been a little more accurately dealt with, I guess, is she had a conversation with Magda about doing it. They can kind of gloss over some of that coordinates. It's not, the, again, not the end of the world, but in the reality of it, it's like, woof, that's, uh, that wouldn't actually happen. Yeah. But they find another body, another two bodies. Yeah, yeah, two bodies. Um, So they find a badly broken knee, a uh, badly healed broken knee, and his skull with an unhealed fracture. With the unhealed fracture means that's often what killed the person. Yeah. Um, And so they call the deputy. Which, yes. Yes, that absolutely. That you should do. You should do, right. <laughs> what you shouldn't do is... Uh, form a living barrier between the forensics team and the potential crime scene. Right. Yeah. Which is what they do because Indeed. they've got demands. Which at this point, the archaeologist's job is in reality is over. Right. You are not part of the equation anymore. You remove yourself from the site. Yeah. It there, now is the jurisdiction now. of law enforcement and the medical examiner. Right. And so there's a, a lines from Magda, which I thought was interesting. We have uncovered bones that are clearly not recent. That is correct. Do they constitute evidence of a crime that's recent enough to prosecute? That's what they're trying to find out. Yeah, it's not the archaeologist's job to determine that. Right. Or is the killer, if there even is one, long dead, in which case this is an archaeological site that my team is trained and qualified to excavate? Again. No, you're not. Well, if it's an archaeological site, it's not a murder. Right, but we do not know that. We do not know that. That's <laughs> why they need the forensics team right. to decide that. And at this point, I feel like, in reality, Sheriff Mike should be like, hey guys, not your jurisdiction. Any more step away yeah leave the island right like, you guys go home or, or ask questions of the people who found it or something yeah but, yeah but he does not do that he does not do that they come to a compromise which honestly is not on the surface a bad idea and essentially they set it up so that Faye and magda are basically monitoring the investigation from outside the area or supposed to be outside the area right supposed to be <laughs> again on the surface if this was an archaeological site that's not a bad thing that archaeologists would have some contribution, but also they are definitely getting in the way of investigating the crime scene. Yeah. So there's no way they would tolerate that, basically. Right. And rightly so. But narratively, it makes it a lot more interesting, I would say. Yeah, definitely. I was reading this and I was just like, oh my gosh, this is hilarious. Yeah. Like, and then, his, you his know, descriptions Faye, of his consternation with them and Magda like, just da -da -da -da, yeah, you know, throwing like, tools at them and saying, do it this way. And then <laughs> he said, this is a barrier. This is a glass barrier. And he's like, it must be saran wrap because Faye keeps leaning over. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was him being irritated by them was very fun to read. Yeah. So I did enjoy that. Yeah. But I was like, Mike, yeah. assert your authority. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So they find a pelvis, a female who had born a child, and they also find out that someone had dug up and reburied these bones. Mm -hmm. They don't know when, but essentially it's the tree had grown up and grown around some of them, so they couldn't, it was they're having trouble getting them all out. Yeah. And there's kind of an ominous thought from Sheriff Mike. They have a child and a, and a woman who had born a child, and he says, a mother is an easy victim because you can threaten the child and get compliance, even if her baby's 30 years old. And I thought, I just have to wonder because uh, part of my head i'm wondering if cyril's mom didn't leave in some reason because of the situation with abby uh -huh. I don't, i'm not i'm not 100 on that timeline yeah this i don't know how much we want to speculate Right. I don't want to meta our mystery novel too much. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting because yeah. he realizes this is obviously not Abby. Abby never had a kid. So they find a second pelvis and Faye and Magda cross the police tape, which probably should have gotten them tackled. Yeah. Know, really. I feel like there are repercussions yeah. to crossing crime scenes. Especially tape. when you've been told not to. Exactly. Like. But they have found an adult male pelvis this time. So there's at least three bodies here. I know. Bodies are just turning up left and right. 
they go on their lunch break and Faye notices some scar, like some recent scarring on some pine trees. And it looks to be from bullets that they realized probably killed Krista and Sam. Well, they knew. Yeah. Sheriff told her that's yeah. where they found the bullets. Yeah. And um, so they realize they start like kind of triangulating where the shooter would have been, and where Sam and Krista would have been and things like that. <laughs> So this part kind of bothered me. They they're like, oh, yeah, let's look in their field notebook. It's in the shed. I'm like, why is it nobody thought to like, I don't know how I'm not a crime scene investigator, but I feel like if there was a murder, you would have gone through like the shed, seen what was in there. And if there was anything that may be used as evidence. I don't know. I just feel like the investigation maybe wasn't as thorough as it needed to be. Or overlooked something yeah. they shouldn't have. You know. Yeah. But they went in the shed to go get field notebook, Krista and Sam's field notebook. Well, actually, can we before we go into that, can we backtrack just a little bit? Sure. Because Magda points out that the murders were senseless. There was no reason for them to be murdered because the flags weren't going to take them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Where the buried bodies were buried. And this is where they start to have an inkling that, oh, I we think maybe the flags have been moved. I think is where they've kind of. That's reaching. right. You're right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So they thought the flags may have been moved. So and, that's why they wanted to look for their field notebook. To and see. I like Faye's line. Yeah, she's going to go check their notebook for the killer's handwriting that's a great line <laughs> yeah yeah and this is where there's some more weaknesses in the details of the archaeology too for sure do you want to go over sure. them so they're looking through the notebook he's using a pocket knife so he doesn't get fingerprints on it which is probably a smart way of doing that i guess yeah. and they start to talk about the coordinate system which i think is a whole bunch of things that aren't quite right they basically the way we would do this is we would sink a piece of rebar typically uh the rebar would mark a, a spot and and then we would tie that into like the global system and then we would use that point to map in all of our other points. So we know that our coordinates are tied in with the global system. But they don't know what point Krista used when she was putting these in, which means that... Yeah, they didn't have a datum. They didn't have a datum. It means the student decided where the datum was. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. Like the PI would be setting that up yeah. or telling people where to set that up. The way we take field notes, anybody should be able to grab our notebook right. and know what we're talking about and where we're talking about right. and everybody on the crew would know where that what we call the data point datum point is located and they would probably have that one for the whole island even yeah yeah depends on how big this island actually is but it seems like not so big it wouldn't be for the whole island right at least for this Third, survey area right. and then it reveals that the coordinates uh for example are 12 comma 18 feet I noticed that too. And I was like, we don't use feet. <laughs> we don't. The only time we use feet on inches is when we are excavating a building that was built in those. And even yeah. then, not always necessarily. Right. We always use meters. Yes. I know. I know. Even in the United States, yep, we're, we're using the metric system, baby. <laughs> and it's so wonderful. It is. Yes. So definitely they would not be using feet. Right. I also I did also like that if you don't know where the datum is, you could be referencing a site in Peru. Like, well, that's an interesting country to bring up randomly I... after we just read about <laughs> Peru. <sighs> so a little cluster of things that I want to want to reiterate too. like we're talking about these things because we it's obvious to us this is incorrect yeah but for the sake of the story and for people who are not involved in this as deeply as we are it's fine you probably wouldn't even notice it's pretty yeah it's minor it doesn't really impact the storyline in any way but talking about the archaeology is why we're doing this yes. so we're going to talk about this yeah. stuff and can we all just start using metric system <laughs> really it's so much it. better <laughs> so they do find Find some of the entries had been altered mm -hmm. and they suspect that what may have happened is the murderer might have tried to remove the bodies beforehand but realized they couldn't because of the tree roots and so the murder was their second option essentially yeah doesn't seem like a great second option if you're trying to not be discovered yeah uh, yeah they have five total bodies now including sam and krista on this island yes a lot of dead people. Yep. And Faye connects that this person might have seen her digging Abby up. Yeah, I thought this was interesting because just now Faye's starting to realize like, oh my gosh, I might be in danger. 
my illegal activity. Well, she kind of knew before, but for some reason it's hitting a little harder now yeah. or something. And I'm like, yeah. But she also realizes that she actually finally has to do the right thing because this person, not only is this like a thing that happened ages ago and they might even be dead, but this is someone who's still killing and could kill again. Right. So she has to do it because it, this could be someone else's death in the future. So she's kind of preparing herself for the consequences of her actions, which I, you know, credit on that, I guess. Although a little later than it probably should have, but she's willing to do that at all, I guess. Basically, she's going to have um, low opinions from other people, bankruptcy, court, prison. Um, and she knows she's going to lose Joyos in this situation. Right. And she also mentions like how it's going to possibly leave Joe homeless. Right. That's even mentioned in there. Yep. Or implicate him in her activities even yeah. when he wasn't actually doing that or profiting off that especially. Yeah. So her plan is to call Cyril and get him out to Joyus and try and set up a thing where basically he takes ownership of it with or he, she's gonna use it as like collateral, collateral if if he'll i guess manage it or yeah something. Lend, and she essentially knows that she's going to lose it in this scenario but she knows that in that situation will go to him yeah and that's preferable to her and that makes sense to me yeah. he wouldn't be the worst choice in this scenario of course he's a politician yeah I but still he don't also quite trust the man but he also has the money that she's going to need for court and everything yeah so yeah if he'll pay for bail and court and all that or lend her the money she'll use joyous as collateral so we go back to Callie one more time for this episode. Yes. And we find out that Mr. Courtney, uh, the son of Andrew's second wife, we never get her her name, I don't no. think. She agrees to go to the Last Isles Hotel. And Callie thinks that, hopes that she'll be taken along and be away from Andrew. And it turns out the missus wants Andrew to go with her. But then this is where Callie sleeps and has a dream that he's going to die. And in her dream, she killed him. Yeah. Which is not how I understood that going down, but I'll be interested to find out. Right. And I, I'm just very interested in like Callie's premonitions. It's very interesting to me. Yeah. But yeah, that's how it ends, which what a cliffhanger. Right. Yeah. And we'll find out next episode how that goes. Yeah. Just to remind you once again, uh, we have that pull up on Spotify with those books for you all to vote on and let us know which ones you prefer. Uh, frankly, any of them sound good. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens there. Yeah. And the otherwise, uh, do you have any closing thoughts, Barbara? No, I'm just really enjoying this book so far and I can't wait to get to reading because... Find out how it ends. Yeah, yeah. Like left me on a cliffhanger there. Yep. Well, we'll see you all next time then. Yeah. Happy reading, everybody. Archaeology Books for Fun is brought to you by the Florida Public Archaeology Network, a program of the University of West Florida. You can find out more about archaeology and about FPAN at fpan.us. We appreciate any feedback, so if you're listening to us as a podcast, please leave us a review, and if you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Thanks for listening.